So, thank you very much. We've got a very exciting panel. Um, I'm Natasha Engel. I'm uh, CEO of Palace Yard, which is a new think tank. Um, I'm, a former, uh, I'm a former politician, which I'm sort of often reluctant to admit to people, but um, it's a long time ago now, and, uh, and I'm way beyond it. Um, but uh, it's been very interesting to sort of get involved in, in the whole hydrogen discussion, um, uh, mainly because it is so complex. Um, and are we going to have that podium on there? Okay, uh, just come up on the yes. stage. Um, it's, it's been a really, really complex uh, policy area altogether to get involved with, and I think all these sort of different moving parts um, have been really interesting. Come sit down. Yeah, sure. um, have been really interesting to follow, and I think one of the missing pieces. I mean, it's been a very it's been, sorry, just watching. <laughs> there is. Um, <laughs> Thank We're you. watching the instructions from the back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the one of the interesting things about today, hi, hi, yeah. has been um, seeing all those sort of different parts coming together. Um, and the bit that we're going to talk about today uh, in this panel session is uh, is on investment and how to get investment into hydrogen, what's needed. We've got a really fantastic and very varied panel. Um, and I'm going to ask everybody to introduce yourselves. And if you could really sort of go into a bit of detail about your background as well and, you know, what, what you bring to this panel, because I think you, you have got a very, very wide variety of expertise on here. So can we start with you, Anas? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, nice to be here and thanks for uh, showing up. Uh, my name is Inasa Bohamed and I have two hats. One is the entrepreneur hat. Uh, I uh, run a business, a tech business called H2Go Power. We build hydrogen storage infrastructure and we build software solutions to manage hydrogen value chain from end to end. This is one hat. The second hat, I sit on the advisory board of one of the largest uh, climate private equity funds in the world, $3.5 billion beyond net zero, General Atlantic Fund. And we invest a growth capital in uh, businesses, tech businesses that uh, has got strong uh, track record to show a path to net zero. Um, so uh, originally, I'm a, I'm a chemist. My, my PhD was in uh, hydrogen storage a uh, really long time ago, and I was the only person researching that topic at, at, the, at the time in the department. So I'll stop here, because uh, there's, there's quite a that's lot great. of... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> We've got plenty of time, so that's great. Thank you very much, Anas. James, do you want to just say a few words about your background? Sure. I'm James McKay. I'm a director in the energy strategy team at KPMG. So I've been in the energy sector for just over 12 years now. Spent the majority of that in power, so I started my career with a company called Drax, as they were transitioning away from coal to biomass, working in trading strategy and new business development. I then moved into a commercial advisory team in government for three years to advise ministers and senior officials on the commercial aspects of GB policy making. And I joined KPMG just shy of four years ago, where I actually went into the organization to work on conventional power generation. But in my first week, I picked up a hydrogen mandate and I've never put it down since. So I spent the last four years at KPMG working on the hydrogen and carbon capture agenda, building my team out in that time from six or seven people, where we're now over 50, which kind of reflects the amount of interest that there is in this particular space. Uh, I've got a few clients in the room, so I probably have to be relatively careful <laughs> about what I say. Um, but I also chair KPMG's global hydrogen network as well. So that was designed essentially to be a relatively low effort, high impact way of collaborating collaborating with a lot of my international colleagues because this isn't a UK specific issue, this is very much an international issue and that's how our clients view it, so that's how we have to view it as well. That's brilliant and also I mean the fact that you're sort of so involved in sort of transitioning from one to the other that's kind of I think really really important and also um, I'm going to pick on you on all issues to, regarding regulation so <laughs> I'm looking forward to that um, and Will do you want to introduce yourself? Sure don't pick on me though that's um, <laughs> so Will Price I, um, I head our utilities team for from Macquarie in, in Europe um, we are a, a manager of, of third party money pension fund insurance money uh, and, and we've got a, a lot of exposure to, to the energy system, um, in particular the networks. So in, in the UK, companies like National Gas and, and Cadent, um, transmission and distribution networks, uh, and, and likewise in other parts of, of Europe, um, Germany, Central Europe, and down into to Italy, Greece, places like that, on both the power and, and the gas side. And then more broadly, 
as, as Macquarie, uh, we we have things like the Green Investment Group that we, we bought from from UK government, doing a lot in earlier stage technology, um, wind and solar, but also kind of hydrogen generation and, and things like that. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Thank you. And Wade, finally to you. I'm the odd duck here. <laughs> uh, Wade declares I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for World Fuel Services. Uh, and actually, as of the close of the New York Stock Exchange today, we'll be known as World Connect. We're changing our name to reflect everything that we do. Uh, but uh, traditionally, we've uh, been a aviation, marine fuel, land fuel uh, supplier, last mile supplier, logistically, uh, globally. Um, and we've moved into power and gas in the last 10 years. And with that, with our commercial and uh, customers has driven us to go more towards sustainability. So we need to transition. Otherwise, we'll be out of business in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, so, uh, you know, our job is to create shareholder value also. So we need to transition. So I've been involved with that transition. We, uh, we handle PPAs. We're in carbon trading, uh, involved with on-site solar. And uh, recently, uh, last year, uh, bought a company called Meld Energy here in the UK, and we're moving into hydrogen. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I just wanted to start with the sort of the, the really easy question, which, um, which is really around the impact of the um, Inflation Reduction Act in America. I mean, there's l lots and lots of people talk about it all the time and about the impact that it's having. Um, but, I mean, from speaking to people, it's had positive and negative impacts. Um, but I was just wondering, especially from the point of view of an American investor investing in the UK, um, you know, what was attractive about the UK and what has the impact of the, of the IRA been? Yeah, so for the last year, we've been looking at hydrogen and what's our role. Uh, and we came to the conclusion, we were looking at the US, and so we still are, in the UK. But our conclusion was that we needed to be an early... Uh, adopter uh, and invest in production. Normally we're the distribution managing the customer, but uh, we decided that we need to be serious about it. We need to put our money where our mouth is. So when we look at really the IRA, or the IRA, get that right? <laughs> the IRA is not the influence or the UK funding, it's been the project. So the project in the UK that we found, and we've looked at maybe hundreds, um, it is the one that fits us the best, has the quickest impact, uh, and fits our company and, and our customer demand. So it hasn't been that much of an impact. Now, we have opinions on the IRA. Um, you know, more of a personal opinion is I've kind of lived and breathed through some of these before in the U.S., and a political change in 18 months could change all of that. So, and it's, it's, it's actually an, an industrial infrastructure act, not necessarily driving net zero. And here in the UK, the funding and the schemes are driving net zero. So I think that's a big difference in that. Um, but also, I think the political partisan part of it makes it somewhat uncertain. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting point about it being about infrastructure rather than net zero and having very different drivers. Um, I will come back to you on, on this, Wade, but um, just, Will, uh, just from the perspective of a very large-scale global institutional investor who, you know, presumably you've got investments everywhere, what would you say the impact of the ARA and also the um, Net Zero in Industry Act in, in, in EU has been? Yeah, no, so I'd, I'd say it's, um, I'd, I'd, echo, I'd echo a lot of that. It, Previously, there was a there was a tension. I would say, you know, people from a policy perspective wanted to get to, to net zero 2040, 2050, you know, depending on which country you are. And then the tension was affordability, and 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 sort of the pace that people wanted to go. At. And we were, it felt like we were constantly slipping on on whatever the project was. We were always going to slip slip a bit behind. I think this has added a new a new dimension to it. It's now about industrial competitiveness, and and sort of political competitiveness, you know, do we want to lose out to America in terms of IP and, and, and how fast those, those projects move forward. So personally, I, I quite like it because um, it, it sort of it crystallises a lot of the momentum, I think. Um, it is having a big impact. You know, it is a, as you said, it's a global market for, for capital. Um, and I think, I think the UK, Europe, Europe a little bit have been a bit 
complacent around that capital always being available, uh, and we're seeing kind of, especially in a in a rising rate environment uh, and competitiveness for capital, people are people are shifting, mm -hmm. and then that makes funding net zero in UK and Europe a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. And James, what do you, what's what's your view on this? So I, I think it's had a huge impact. Um, I think you, you can see publicly investors pivoting to the US directly from the UK. I think the likes of Hydrogen One have very publicly done that and I've seen it a lot with my clients too. It was almost an overnight impact when the introduction of the IRA came where a lot of our clients were coming to us with questions on project development in the US rather than the UK. But you're not going to find the UK are able to compete on that sort of fiscal stimulus in the same way that you've seen in the US so they'll just have to take a different approach I think and I think for the the biggest frustration for me is, is if you rewind back 12 months it was almost a year to the day there that we convened the Secretary of State at the time with a bunch of senior hydrogen industry bodies and the idea of that session was to light a bit of a fire under the UK government to say look if you don't continue to build that momentum you're going to get international markets that come in, come here and eat your lunch essentially uh, and I think that's essentially what we've seen. We've, al we've almost lost 12 months, the last 12 months in the UK, with the uh, levels of political uncertainty. And I'm afraid it, it feels like as we approach a general election next year as well, we're at risk of losing another 12 months, which we can't afford. So I think my message would be ultimately the UK has to steer the course because they can't compete on that fiscal basis, but they need to do things far faster and show a bit more ambition in terms of the size of the checks that we might be willing to yeah. write to get that manufacturing base here in the UK. I think we'll, we're definitely going to come back to the speed of change and the urgency of, of, of doing things. But Inas, what, what's your experience of the, the impact of the, of the Inflation Reduction Act? Sure, maybe I could, uh, I could put that in, uh, in, a, in a context that is relevant to the stage that, that, that my business is at. So we're no uh, longer building technology and, and testing it. It's a, it's a mature tech business uh, that is not moving from the lab to the field. It's really looking at moving from one field to multiple fields. And then you ask yourself the questions of, where is the country with the piece of policy that allows you to expand in this way? Who is ready to buy technology today because they are committing to projects today? Uh, you look around the UK, you don't find many. Uh, you find like, you know, many big corporates making announcements, encouraging uh, polls, but at the same time, um, in like practically for smaller businesses, uh, we're not an oil and gas business that has 85% of our revenue and profits from a stream and we're getting into hydrogen. We are a hydrogen business, that's all what we do. So we have to sell our technology somewhere in a field where the demand is there. I can't say that the demand in project in the UK is very high today, but having said that, let's not bash the UK because I think they've done many, many good things uh, on innovation, R&D, getting us to where we are today. I mean, my business is nine years old, so when I started to pitch hedge to go power, it was very difficult to, uh, to get a single investor to take me seriously because there was no market I could t connect to or there's no business logic to say, we're building a technology that is going to be used in a 20 gigawatt uh, project. There, was, there were no 20 gigawatt projects at the time. So the, the only investor in that case was actually the UK government and not many countries around the world built businesses like us. Uh, and the UK was, was, was a good example for that. So that's something that they score very high and, and they've done very well. In my opinion, like, you know, if you have the ability to be practical and leverage the opportunities in both worlds, that's where you could win as a business because timing matters. We do have net zero targets to reach. We do have a lot of um, uh, technological advancements and demonstrations to show. But at the same time, we really care about what happens in the next 12 months. That's critical for us. Yeah, yeah. So just, I mean, you know, from, from your experience, how do you feel that the UK should best respond to it? I mean, you've, you've sort of talked, touched on some of the advantages. I mean, there definitely are advantages in the UK that other countries don't have. I mean, it, 
it being sort of globally, we've just heard from Western Australia, um, you know, different countries have different natural advantages. Um, what are some of those when, when you look at the UK, whether that's from sort of from regulation or, you know, government, I know a, a year before a general election probably, so there is that uncertainty, but there's also regulatory stability, I would say, lots of sort of maturity in, in, in regulation. Uh, that's a really good question, and I really want to answer it from a perspective of a, a tech business. And you'll, you'll have many different opinions f f like to cover the entire industry. But maybe from a, a tech business perspective, um, if the UK could respond in a way that says, you know, the technology is mature and ready to deploy, but still the cost of it today, because you don't have many buyers, is still higher than competition in alternative technologies, like natural gas, for example, to get down to the right unit economics, going down that curve, somebody needs to intervene. You can't just rely on the customer. Because if the customer have demand and they're not comfortable with the price, they're not going to buy new technology, even if they believe in it. They need somebody to come in and say, you know, we'll take the, uh, the loss. We need you to buy and we need you to produce. And by being, uh, being there in the middle, facilitating that process with a piece of policy, we grow manufacturing in the UK, we create the type of jobs that don't exist and need to exist for, for the growth of that industry, and that's national power. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the UK need to do, in, in my opinion, in the context of, of uh, how to grow a technology to a position that it serves its uh, national market, but also export internationally yeah. Yeah. at a serious scale. Yeah, yeah. Could you pick up that regulation point, James? Yeah, sure. I should be clear, I'm not a regulatory expert. No, no. Uh, no. <laughs> you, you knew a lot about it when we no, spoke, no, no, so absolutely. I just thought it really interesting. I've got the yes. benefit of having a lot of ex Ofgem and Beers alumni in my team. Uh, so ah, okay. I hear a lot of the discussions that go on. <laughs> um, one of the things for me uh, would be, obviously, in the interest of staying the course, is around carbon pricing. I think that's a real strength of the UK in terms of giving that certainty and clarity to investors in that energy transition. Obviously, the US doesn't have a federal level carbon tax, so if we're making that comparison, that's something that the UK does essentially benefit from in terms of stability. Um, there's a couple of things for me. One would be around institutional reform. I think it's becoming such an incredibly complex issue, the broader energy transition, which hydrogen sits at the heart of, that I don't think our institutions in the UK are set up to deliver the sort of success we need and the coordination we need. So I think that first point around, are our, are our institutions set up correctly in terms of DESNES, Ofgen, the FSO, and the roles they play? Is there any way to bring those together in, in, in the form of some sort of energy agency which can help design and execute what's needed across the various value chains? Um, but specifically on hydrogen, I think there's been a lot of emphasis on upstream in terms of how you accelerate uh, hydrogen production. I don't think there's been the same sort of urgency in the UK on that midstream and downstream. And we're engaging a lot with large industrial off-takers at the minute who, who frankly are really struggling. Uh, so the chemical industry, for example, they're operating at such fine margins when you go and have a conversation with them about making a capital investment into converting a kiln or a dryer or something like that. It scares them the, sort of, the prospect of having to go to their board and re uh, request that sort of capex for that sort of conversion. But those are the conversations they've been forced to have now because a lot of these big producers who are in line for these subsidy contracts have to find people to sign those off-tier contracts. And there's a question around whether that off-take sector is set up and ready to move at the pace that production will on the back of the incentives that we're seeing upstream relative to downstream yeah. as well. Wade, do you want to pick that up? Because uh, you know, in, the, in the past we've had conversations about third-party risk-taking intermediaries and you know, the, the, the problems um, with that. Do you want to just pick up on that? Yeah, so uh, I think I mentioned, but we, you know, we announced a 100 megawatt project in the uh, salt and chemical park. Uh, and we really didn't have a problem with them wanting to have the offtake. Uh, of course, with the government, you know, uh, contract for difference, that has to be, that's critical for this. Uh, but um, we have to play at that as the producer. Otherwise, we're not allowed to play in this game. So that's one reason why we chose this path. Uh, but I think it's something that needs to be considered by the government that companies like ourselves, uh, to go to market with these products, you need traders, you need aggregators of demand, 
you know, the, the salt in, uh, uh, chemical park has the demand right there. So we don't have to ship it. We don't have to aggregate demand. We have plenty of demand. But as this, as this business grows, uh, it takes companies like us to do the last mile, which is aggregating demand. Because one, most infrastructure funds and developers that we talk to don't really want to get involved with the customer. So you need that intermediary. And it's not allowed right now. So that's something that, that the UK government could change to help drive investment. We will vest if we can play that part. Yeah, yeah. And from a sort of a, a, a sort of a more global, sort of wider perspective from Macquarie Group, um, is that also an issue? I'm assuming it is. Um, yes and no. I think your point on on you know the UK maturity of, of regulation and you know I think is right and and. Every country always has a political cycle, so you sort of you look through that to a certain extent. Um, you know, the UK has been a fantastic place for some of these technologies. You know, Denmark invented, you know, offshore wind, and then the UK kind of industrialised it, and then the world sort of benefited and took over, and, and other people are now leading on that. So I think that the UK is a kind of home of IP for some of this stuff. I think it's got a good history, and we can we could do that again with some of the some of the new technologies. I think. You know, in terms of the government, sort of reflects the public debate. You know, including including you know this room. So I think it's I think it's sort of incumbent on us to the debate feels very polarised and very binary to, to us as an investor. You know, kind of you either love heat pumps or you hate heat pumps or you hydrogen's either a disaster or a saviour of everything. And it's, it's it's obviously just more nuanced than that. And and so the message we try and give is is. Security supply. It was mentioned on the last last fireside chat. Security supply is a is an issue and is a bigger issue than it was two years ago. Let's take a bit less risk on on one technology and and sort of you know recognise that we're probably going to pay a bit more for having that security supply and less technology risk over the next twenty or thirty years. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. And um, I mean, like sort of. Back to Claire, I don't want to sort of uh, drum, beat my own drum uh, sort of on the, my top, uh, my, my uh, pet topics. But I mean, I just think this, this whole point about not just kind of investing, or not just sort of government sort of, um, or any government saying it's one thing or another, where this whole system approach is really important, that it's, you know, in order to get to net zero by 2050, is really everything and much more rapidly. Um, I mean, in terms of sort of, I mean, we've been talking, I'm amazed that chicken and egg hasn't come up more often today, but, you know, we've been talking a lot about what needs to happen in order to, you know, um, there's lots of demand out there and there's lots of people who want to invest in the sort of the more supply side. But in terms of really getting that kick started, really getting that going, uh, it just sort of feels like there are lots of kind of small decisions that government sort of, you know, waiting until 2026, whether... But on home heat, uh, hydrogen for home heating, whether it has a role, which seems from this point of view quite far off, um, when actually those sort of decisions feel like they, those sort of things need to be taken now. Yeah. Um, I mean, what what are some of those other ones? Would you say where you know where things could be done much more quickly? Uh, on so on domestic heating, the um, mandatory hydrogen ready boilers for us seems like a no a no brainer. You know, there is a question of. Will people use hydrogen in their homes in 30 years' time? I think that that question still has to be answered. Um, but but the cost is the same. So mandating a hydrogen-ready boiler seems to us like a no a no-brainer. Um, on the industrial side, you know, industrial and, and power gen side, I think it does need government to to try and break that chicken and egg um, and and be a, be a bit clearer on what is the revenue model. You know, is it regulated or commercial? And if it's commercial. You know, is there a cost gap that, that the government needs to subsidise, or that that stuff feels like a sort of easy win as well to us? Yeah, yeah. What about sort of uh, in terms of risks versus opportunities? I mean, one of you know one of the big issues about third party um, uh, third party intermediaries is using public money in a value for public money sort of way um, and making sure that people sort of don't game the system. That's always what government's really really worried about but um, you know it, is there a way that they can that they can do this so that it kind of unleashes much more investment where because there there is a at the moment it is quite first mover um, so there is a risk by investors uh, which 
sometimes investors don't feel that government's quite recognizing. Yeah. Is that, is that, would that be right? No, I think we're under a lot of risk of what we're trying to do. So we're following the customer. We're following the demand. Uh, like I said, it was about the project, not where we did it. Um, we had a demand. We had an off taker that, that was ready to take the product. Um, at the right price uh, and we find out with everybody everybody wants to talk about it every customer everybody's going to do it whether it's shipping aviation we we do uh, uh, SAF we were one of the first uh, investors in SAF 12 years ago uh, everybody wants it but nobody wants to pay for it it's a little bit for show uh, but long term you know uh, they will jump in but it, mining was brought up you know we talked to all the mining companies and they're all yeah we're in hydrogen but well, maybe, you know, if the price is right. And shipping, same thing. We'll take e-methanol, but we're going to dual fire power ships, and maybe we'll take it if you get the price down. Yeah. So that's a, that's a tough thing. But the, there's other challenges, too, that uh, in the U.K. that, you know, does concern us. Uh, we think it'll work out, but, you know, grid connections <laughs> is a big problem. Um, you know, making sure there's enough renewable energy to power hydrogen production. Uh, that's on site or here in the UK, uh, but the grid connection is is a big one. Yeah. Um, you know the queue is is quite long. Um, they're making steps to change that, but if we you know get the government funding, we're ready to go. If we can't know that we're going to get a grid in two years connection, then the project's dead. Yeah. So there's these kind of things too that that you know we need to take care of, or the government needs to look at to help drive the decisions. Um, the chicken and eggs always going to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until it's a mature market, of course. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about that on-grid connection, James? So I think it's a really interesting point. I think one one of the first conversations one, one of the first conversations of its kind I've had quite recently is where I've had a pretty prominent renewables developer come to me and basically say they don't think they are going to be able to develop their projects offshore in the Irish Sea and the North Sea and offshore in Norway without some sort of hydrogen blending playing a role in the UK. They just don't have faith in the current uh, transmission system to get this amount of connections required to develop the projects they need. And blending, I think, is a really interesting one that we haven't touched upon yet. And We've been going around a lot of uh, the larger scale producers, typically blue hydrogen, but also some big industrials and exploring how they feel about how this transition is going with hydrogen. And one of the consistent bits of feedback we get is around volume risk and I know there's ways to address that through subsidy but I think supporting blending now is the right thing to do and I appreciate it's, a, it's essentially a low value use of a high value product which is the argument you consistently get back from government and they're not wrong but that ignores the value that it can play in other parts of the value chain so supporting investment in, in the production and also making it slightly easier to incrementally uh, lower the carbon intensity of of the grid as well. Yeah. So I think hydrogen blending feels like a one for me. It's, it's an imperfect solution, yeah. but it feels like a necessary step on that transition to having a yeah. more national hydrogen market. That's no, so a really good point about blending. And yeah, no, I think it's, um, yeah. And it's also something that could, in theory, happen tomorrow. So, and there's an immediate off-taker for the hydrogen. And it's interesting because obviously there's quite a few people in this room who I typically work with on the gas networks who, who would support that. But that, that point about a renewable developer fervently believe in that their only route to market, realistic route to market for the sort of scale of development projects they're talking about is through blending some sort of hydrogen into the yeah. national transmission system. Yeah. Um, and also, just back to sort of um, James' point about grid and what we've just been talking about, is there sort of, you know, from a sort of entrepreneurial point of view and somebody who's sort of more into the tech data side of this, is there a better way that we could use the data digitalization um, in, a, in order to maximize grid capacity beyond just having to build more pylons? Uh, fantastic question. Um, I think this is the way forward. And there is a leverage here uh, for um, optimization that we're, we're not inventing like new type of technology. AI is not, is not something that my company invented in, in any way. We just use it in this context. Uh, let's let's take the lessons learned from the natural gas industry. So today, probably all the people on the panel could agree. Please tell me if if you don't. But we have many natural gas 
um, assets that's been committed to uh, operational, but not at full capacity. You cannot monetize them because you oversize them in the first place, thinking that this is the most uh, uh, profitable way to do it in case you needed to use more assets so you don't build more. The end result is that because they were not optimized at a design stage, you have invested billions and, and you'll never monetize that. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, this was way before the digital industry happened, right? So we did not have tools to actually optimize natural, the natural gas industry because we've built it before the digital industry. Whereas with the hydrogen industry, it's coming actually after uh, the digital industry and after we have le learned all the, uh, the lessons from the natural gas industry. And how can we use it here? We're saying now is hydrogen is all about, so we know that the demand is there, the problem is the price, and offtake agreements are basically price multiplied or committed to very long period of time. Not many people want to do it because they're not happy with the price. Now, it's not enough to just build infrastructure. It's very important, if you want to get down to the right price point, to actually use technology, AI, digital, digitalization, to actually uh, get, to, like, help infrastructure to work at pricing that are better, by sizing it uh, appropriately, by utilizing it appropriately. That could have a massive impact on reducing the price to a point that the customer is happy with it. And then the hydrogen economy becomes, it's not a 2030 uh, uh, discussion to be have whether I can sell something to an FT, off taker because that's when I, get, I can get the, the price right with all the subsidies and, and incentives. We could, we could shift that a bit earlier and make it more uh, profitable and commit, uh, um, compelling if we use the AI to predict when is the best time to generate the molecule. What's the best technology to generate it with? When is the, where are the inefficiencies in a broken value chain where you have many different components? Every piece that carries risk, if you optimize for risk, you, you, you uh, reduce that risk and you can generate more money. And if you can uh, come up with a tool that predicts from end to end what's going to happen on a project, especially at large scale, you could save millions and potentially billions. And that's, that's, that's what we do with, with the AI piece of software that we've built. That's, I'm going to come straight to you on that, Will, because actually that's a, it's a really interesting point about infrastructure and investment in infrastructure. And what new infrastructure do you need and kind of really designing at concept stage really what the future of it is going to be. But at the same time, the existing infrastructure that we have and how, how mm. that needs to be used because we've got it and it is massive. Yeah, that's um, you know, and and that, that's really what you're invested in and making those intelligent investments in order to link up the new infrastructure with, with what exists. I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah, yeah. Look, so I'd, uh, I'd say maybe a couple of things. One, it's always better to retrofit. You know, so so if, if we can retrofit, um, which in a lot of the networks you, you can do that. You can you can blend up to a certain point, and then with a bit of with a bit of investment, you can retrofit. You know, sometimes you need a new network. So in the UK, the NTS is going to build a two thousand kilometre new backbone network to to link up all the clusters, <laughs> potentially export into into Europe. But it, but in the most part, you can you can retrofit. When you get down to the, the kind of local household capillary network, you know, power or, or gas side, um, it's a bit more complicated. And that's part of the reason I think this journey to, to net zero will be pretty complicated. You know, to try and retrofit houses that were built 100 years ago in central London yeah. with more insulation, physically, how do you do that? Yeah. You know, without, without sort of shrinking the size of your house or ripping up, ripping up whole streets of London. So at a at a high pressure or high voltage end, you know, pretty straightforward. Locally in capital city centres, pretty yeah. difficult. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to open up to the audience now because I think there's quite a lot of different sort of aspects that we've touched on. And also, if you, if you are using the app, I don't, I don't know whether people have been putting questions in, um, but do kind of fill up my screen down here because it's empty. Um, but yeah, if, if there's any qu audience questions uh, from what we've raised on investment, yeah, somebody at the back? Well, this one is going to be a hard one. 
As somebody that is working on, on solutions to actually provide a cost-effective uh, production of hydrogen, I understand, I mean, I've been looking, I've been researching this for nearly a decade, and I've been building my electrolyzers for nearly a decade. The ge Australian gentleman asked, can we do it? I will tell you, you can't do it. You will never do it with the existing technologies. Whatever is on the market today is not going to do it. It's not going to cut the cake. So with the gentlemen that are talking about... Uh, uh, by the way, in us, I'm a follower. I follow you. So I think you're doing a good job with that uh, storage. But anyway, with, with the investment, is there going to be a shift towards people that actually know how to produce hydrogen? Because your technologies now are not even good enough for to be put in this museum. The technologies that, are you, that you're using, all, all, that, all that they would do is they would fill up a room in some sort of a museum. I mean, you can't go on uh, uh, thinking that you're going to produce something and expect to push the, the, the consumer and ask them to pay you more and more money for it. They're not going to buy it. So why is, it, why is that persistent existing to just do with what you are, uh, you know, with the technologies that you have. I know because I've, I, I've been, like I said, I've been working on it. We, we can't get no funding. Somebody like us can't get no funding because our technology is considered by so-called investors too disruptive. We can produce three and a half times more gas than any existing technology out there on the market. So if you, are, if you were after, and this is the question, if you were after, uh, you know, giving hydrogen, green hydrogen, to the world, are you going to invest into, or is anybody going to invest into game-changing technologies? Or are they just going to sit down and do the talk, talk, and talk, and not deliver anything? Because you're not going to deliver it with the current technologies. Thank you. I think that is the classic chicken and egg example, though, isn't it? It's kind of, what do you have to do? What, what, kind, of, what kind of frameworks do you have to put in place? And that's really what we're trying to get at here. What kind of policy frameworks need to be put in place in order to get that kick started. I think that's what, does anybody else want to pick well, that up? I've got a, I, I like what you just said. So I wouldn't say I'm an investor that's <laughs> not open to that. I think that's why we invested in MELD. We invested in talent and knowledge um, and uh, to open the door. So us getting involved and in actually putting our money where our mouth is, if it happens, uh, you know, everybody has to play their part which share the risk, but if that happens, which I think it will, but it opens the door. I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you. You know, I'm meeting other people. So I, I find in this industry, it's interesting, hydrogen's been around for a long time. It's nothing new, as you say. But trying to make it green and trying to make it economical is the, is the, is the big challenge. So having that uh, ecosystem and starting to get involved is really our goal. We're not going to make any money on this anytime soon so our, our our role now is how to is it something that's real um, you know I, I'll, I'll go back to LNG uh, you know it was going to be everything for everybody for a while and everybody was on the bandwagon for LNG then you realize the cost of conversion was out of sight right so barges you know trucking everything it was going to do shipping it it didn't happen that way it was too costly so, uh, so I, I agree with you. So I think, you know, we'll probably be talking to you, Chris, right? Um, so uh, for us, it's a learning. It's, it's getting involved. So yeah, we're not hydrogen producers. There are hydrogen producers now. I'm sure their, their technology is far more than what we're thinking. But it will take people with us that want to take some risk. And it's also us listening to the customer when they're ready and how they want it. Just while you're on, Wade, uh, the, the, one of the questions from the audience is um, just to share what differentiated MELD from other developers you reviewed. So it's kind of why here, yeah. why this? Um, I think it was uh, a couple of things. The talent. So uh, Chris, Chris Smith is here, your CEO. Uh, it was the talent. and it was, a, it was a relationship building. He had to educate us. Uh, he had to, to convince us that we were willing to take that risk. Uh, a lot of developers, again, don't have a lot of commercial sense. Uh, and so we needed somebody that, we're the commercial guys, you're the technical guys, we needed to be able to bridge that gap. So that was probably our main reason, going with MELD, and, and, uh, and then we want to build from there. 
Great, thank you. Did anybody else want to pick any of that up? Otherwise, we'll, we'll move on to another question. So there's one specifically for you, Anas, um, about optimised infrastructure for hydrogen transport and storage and what that might look like over the next five to seven years. So a uh, really good question because it allows me to clarify. So it's not infrastructure for hydrogen transport and storage only. It's optimised infra infrastructure to optimise the entire value chain from generation to uh, consumption uh, or offtake. Um, so, for example, if you were able to predict the destiny of the molecule and its price from before its birth, tying it into moving factors like uh, what's your connection to the grid look like, uh, what's the pricing of renewable energy, are you tied uh, to any PPAs, green PPAs, uh, what techno electrolysis technology that I mean we've, we've, we've had a mention of that what 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 electrolysis technology are you using is it a good one is it a resilient one is it a, is it one that breaks which is going to cost you and then what happens afterwards are the, if are you converting that uh, that hydrogen are you selling it as a commodity who's buying it at, at what, what's the contract with the off taker that you have at what price having the ability to predict all of that uh, means that you could really sell at a price that the customer wants to buy and have a contract that looks like uh, favorable for both sides, those who want to sell and those who want to buy. Uh, so uh, optimizing infrastructure means that we have to speak to the network, we have to speak to the grid, we have to speak to the um, a, a off taker, the user, the manufacturer of, of, of the technology. Somebody needs to manufacture really good uh, electrolyzers. So, uh, you know, so the whole value chain is, is held together in a robust way. Uh, connecting all these bits together is the optimization and has, uh, infrastructure has a big part to play in that. Economical optimization has a big part to play in that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, is it Alex? Yeah. yeah, so Alex from Bosch, who's Italian and very philosophical, so I'm oh. hoping for a very philosophical question from you. Oh, actually, well, <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's Alex. Um, maybe building on what we just mentioned about jumping out of this chicken and egg cycle we are in at the moment over this production generation and then distribution of hydrogen. Um, how much the academic field in Britain can impact breaking this chicken and egg loop in terms of hydrogen investment. Because of course, the body of knowledge has the potential to shape and reshape uh, um, hydrogen research, for example. And this is exactly the question I just want to throw to you. With your expertise in, in this field, you can have the, the top universities in the world and then automatically build up the talents that we're so much talking about in the hope in a better future to shift the strategies for hydrogen. So, comments around this? Yeah, it's a great question. And there was somebody else over there while, while we answer it, um, in the middle over here somewhere. Um, so, how do we break the chicken and egg cycle? I mean, I th in terms of investment, I think it's really, really important. It's kind of really what, what steps need to be taken in order to get that going. I mean, that's fundamentally what this is about, isn't it? Do you want to pick that up, Will? Yeah, sure. No, on, on the network side, I... I I don't see the chicken and egg as much. I think I think we've sort of cracked that on the network side. Um, you know, in that projects are getting built, and and where there is a a revenue model and uncertainty about you know what risks you're taking and and how do you earn money on that, companies are keen to you know spend money on capex. So network companies typically like big capex programs. So they're they're kind of keen to get on with it. It's more I think it's more on the um, on the generation and and offtake that um, that the chicken and eggs exist, so um, they're happy to touch on on the network and the storage side, but but I, I see less of the chicken and egg there. Okay, great. What about you? I, I, it goes back to that institutional reform uh, yeah. point to me. I, I think we need to be thinking more holistically as we develop the two value chains. Yeah. I think if you if you look at, if you're assessing them all and developing them all in isolation, you're going to consistently have this chicken and egg problem. I think that whole more holistic thinking, from particularly from whoever's responsible for driving this in the UK, uh, whether that's the uh, policy makers in Bayes, yeah. those who hold the purse strings in Treasury, regulators in Ofgem, or the future system operator, I think you've got to be thinking about this holistically, otherwise you're always going to run into that problem. Yeah, yeah. Wait, did you want to add something to that? 
No? no okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe just look at examples like series. Uh, and I hope to be one as well. This, the, this is research that came from universities in, in the UK. This, this, the, the start is from a solution that you think it, it could get to, to the right commercial path. The main investor is, is the, the government. This is, uh, this is R&D. I mean, y y the industry does, w did not so far historically invest in new technologies like that because the demand was not there. Maybe at a point when, when the demand is there, it becomes government and industry. But at this stage, I would say, if, if I have only like one option to give you like one answer, I'd say government will, will pay for R&D until there is enough demand from industry to improve technology, to improve performance, that they know they can sell it. Like, you know, that improved performance sell at, at, at a better pr premium. That's why I'm going to go to this university that has these capabilities. So yeah, it starts with, with government. I think, I think the chicken and egg problem is also a, another really big issue with it is that it makes it so complex for <coughs> politicians, p people who are making decisions, and so they don't really know what, where to go first, and it's technically complex as well, and so it can be really overwhelming, and I think part of, part of the role of you know, the likes of Chris the, and, and the gentleman at the back is kind of actually explaining this in terms that, that government and decision makers can understand. Um, and that's the only way that they can then put, yeah, exactly, put those policies in place. The lady at the front. Hello, so my name is Casey Milne from the uh, Catapult Network, and I spoke earlier this morning. I just wanted to build on what Anas said and, and respond to your question as well. Um, so the government's funded a series through EPSRC of hydrogen hubs, one of which, H2FC Supergen, um, finished in December last year in this room actually um, and they've got fabulous research which looks all the way from hydrogen technologies many spin outs from from you know that that um, university consortium and looks all the way through to the whole systems modeling piece they've now just launched two more hubs so one called high high res led by Bath University which is looking at hydrogen tech another called high act which is looking at the whole systems modeling piece and then in the translational research space, my network of organizations, the Hydrogen Innovation Initiative, is working to do things like pull through of university technologies, scale up. One of our partners is the Energy Systems Catapult, which is a whole systems modeling tool set and is looking to, we, we want to provide a kind of central reference base which is updated annually with input from all of the end use sectors and, and input sectors for hydrogen so that we've got that single source of truth, at least for the UK anyway. Um, you know, so there's, there's some, there's, it's, I think it's the UK's strength. Our academic base, our innovation ecosystem is world class and that's something that I think you're right, we can leverage, but we need to work more closely in partnership with this group, the investor community, in order to really unlock that pipeline for of, of UK supply chain. Yeah, I think another another one of the big UK advantages is uh, the clusters, um, where things are quite sort of well, clustered around ports and industries in in certain areas, energy intensive um, in industries in in those clusters. I think that actually, you know, that that, that is. It, is that not a, a, an advantage in the UK? It's something that's attractive for investors like you, Wade? It is. It is. I'm looking at this other question, too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I kind of want to answer Yeah, yeah. No, no, do, do, do so, that one, yeah. I think it's right. So, so... Uh, I'll just read it. So, it's, yeah. it's store um, H2 e ERA, uh, store and transport to big hydrogen user factories is very risky. Why not produce inside the factories and store less? Yeah, and that's exactly what we're doing yeah. at Salt In. Uh, that's a starting place uh, to do that. So we see on-site uh, on so on hydrogen production, uh, kind of the beginning of hydrogen use. And in existing businesses that use hydrogen now, uh, the future of transport is a future. It's, it is ways out. Uh, I mean, 20 years, I think, before it's even anything significant. So our focus is, you know, until the large-scale projects are up and running and all the economics and the storage is put in and there's ships to build, all these things, a lot of things are going to happen. But a lot of people have made pledges to their net zero commitment goals in these industries. And some of them aren't going to be able to reach it. So they're going to have to take a choice if they backtrack or do something else. 
and one of the solutions is on-site hydrogen production. So I, I, that's what I think we're focused on right now. Um, in the long run, we'll be focused on storing it, moving it, the logistics of it, and managing the customer. Well, yeah, go ahead. I think absent a midstream, I don't think you have much choice, do you? If, you? if you've not got the midstream infrastructure in place, then I think inevitably co-location is going to play a hugely important role, particularly this decade and probably next decade. And it's not completely delinked to the question you asked about mm -hmm. industrial clusters as well. Having that concentration of emissions in a finite number of places geographically spread across the UK is actually really helpful from the co-location perspective. So if you look at a, a site like Salt End, uh, you don't just have one off-taker, you're within proximity to multiple off-takers and that gives you an opportunity to identify an anchor project for that initial pro uh, production and then build out green hydrogen hubs and I think that's what you'll see in some of the bigger oil and gas players who are more vertically integrated in this space doing is using their own source of demand in some of these industrial regions to uh, make the business model work for the hydrogen production with the view to then supply in multiple different types of off-takers. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, just from the point of view of, a, of an in investor, Will, is it, are things going fast enough? And if they're not going fast enough, then what needs to be done to, to speed things up a bit? I mean, this kind of, those sort of transitions that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, no, I think so. Uh, I think because uh, uh, something I said earlier on, on uh, tension between affordability and pace, and you know affordability is 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 a big topic. So you know going faster, especially in some you know nascent technologies, brings with it you know cost risk. Um, so I think that, I think that bit's that bit's going fast. Just I mean to pick up on on this, I don't I don't think it is risky. I'm, I'd sort of dispute that. You know, transportation of hydrogen is risky. Um, so you know, I, th I think I think the the safety piece and the um, the engineering piece of this is done. There's a lot of um, user acceptability for some of these for some of these technologies. You know, if you, if you ask, and there's been trials in the UK, in Germany, in Holland on, on this sort of stuff. If you say to people, you know, you're going to have to move away from natural gas eventually. Do you want a heat pump or do you want a hydrogen boiler? They just say neither, and say you know, go and test somebody else's village and come back to me in ten years. So there's a there's a kind of that for me is the biggest piece that we've got to crack on on kind of yeah. end user or customer acceptability. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that sort of the democratic consent point is very very important. And I think education is key. I always come back to that. I come from a family of teachers up in the northeast, so it always comes back to education. I think we've done the easy part, right? We've replaced a lot of dirty electrons with clean electrons, and we haven't really had to alter our life much in the last couple of decades to achieve that. But going forward, the harder to abate sector is going into people's homes, telling them what to eat, how to travel from a consumer perspective perspective that's far more complicated and I think without education sitting at the centre of that so people being able to relate to the news stories they're seeing about uh, re more regular climate extreme climate scenarios around flooding wildfires and everything else with their everyday lives on how they heat their homes how they travel without that connection you're never going to the, the ends are never going to justify the means in the consumer's eyes but you see how quickly once that education uh, piece is addressed and once people feel motivated to do something about it, we've seen it with the recent war in Ukraine, right, in, in terms of the, how quickly Europe were able to mobilise to reduce their reliance on Russian gas because there was sheer necessity there. I think the thing that's missing from the broader climate debate is people don't recognise that necessity is there yet, the general public, and that comes down fundamentally to, to education. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and us, just sort of uh, to finish off on what the opportunities are and uh, I mean, just you as, a, as an entrepreneur um, and back to that sort of education point and, and making that connection with um, with whether they're consumers, customers, or voters, they're all the same people, but um, those are the people that we're going to have to ultimately persuade, um, and, and it's also their money that we're using, it's taxpayer money. Um, but sort of just to emphasize the kind of the more positive opportunity side of it. So uh, on uh, education, I think really hydrogen is a victim here, because Take lithium-ion batteries, right? We all have a phone, it has a battery in it. Do you know what happens if you knock with a hammer on, on a battery? It will explode. Is that safe? No. Combustion engines, you know, 
we mostly drive cars with combustion en engines. Combustion engines are not particularly safe. They are engineered to be safe, same as lithium ion batteries. Uh, so we know how to engineer complex technologies that have safety risks in a, a very safe way so they can be introduced to consumers and consumers could, could use them. And I think we can do that with hydrogen as well as we've done that with, with other technologies. Uh, I feel like that, that part of the debate is not, is not getting across very well in this way. Like there's, a, there's quite a, a strong uh, um, conversation, especially in the UK, about, about hydrogen and heating and what goes around that. And, and maybe, maybe in particular cases like that, if business case, uh, safety cases, um, a, a, like a sustainable business model could be presented, the, the public needs to be taken through the, uh, the process uh, and you know, maybe agitate less people and create camps is, is less of, of an approach that we need to take. And that's an opportunity. Uh, you know, looking at where the problem is and trying to address it in a way where you, you present credible scenarios with challenges and opportunities and examples historically of how we've engineered very safe uh, 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 solutions from dangerous concepts. I think that's, uh, that's an opportunity. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we've got one minute, so it's about enough for me to just thank everybody very, very much for uh, spending an hour up here with me and, uh, and talking through some of these things. I mean, I think in terms of investment, it, you know, the, the potential is, is massive. And you, know, you talk to so many people, they are desperate to invest. They want to invest. And you know, we have had a, a very, very big, have still got very, very big advantages uh, in the UK for investment in hydrogen. Um, and we've got lots of history in oil and gas. We know how to do stuff. We know how to regulate. So um, yeah, no, it's, it's great to have you. And, uh, and also that sort of very wide variety of, uh, of experiences and views. So thank you very much. So if you can just thank them for... Thank you.